Hello, welcome back. We've been looking at the equations of motion that control the motion in the ocean. And what we're going to do right now is go back and think about this idea of Ekman transport and also something we've talked about before, inertial currents and looking at how inertial currents can give us this non-dimensional number, the Rossby number, and also how we can use that to determine what kind of flow we have, and also to see if we have geostrophy. So let's start by looking again at how we get Ekman transport. So we remember that when we have winds blowing along the ocean, that we get a wind stress. And that wind stress is due to the frictional forces between the wind and the water, so the air and the water. So the winds flowing over the sea set that top layer in motion. But as we know, the winds are going in this direction. The motion starts to go in the direction of the wind force, but we have Coriolis because we are on a rotating earth. And so because of that, the direction of motion of the water is not in the exact same direction as the wind, but is in fact offset to the right. Now the layer of water here will pull on the layer of water below it in the same direction. However, that layer of water will not go in the exact same direction, but will in fact be offset to its right and so on and so forth, all the way down the water column. If we take all of these little vectors of motion and we look at them all along the water column and we integrate over all those vectors or we take the sum of, of all those vectors, what we see is that the net flow of this water is in fact at a right angle to the wind. So the resultant volume transport is going to be at right angles to the wind. If we come back to having our wind blowing along the water, and we see that the resultant volume transport is going to be at a right angle to that wind. Now, the water is now moving in a certain direction. And because we are on a rotating earth and we're in the northern hemisphere, Coriolis is going to start to act on the water moving in this direction. And so we end up with Coriolis moving also, pulling, pushing also at a right angle to the volume transport of water. And so what we end up with is that once we get to an equilibrium state, the wind stress is going in this direction. And Coriolis is going to perfectly balance that in the opposite direction. So what we see is that Coriolis will be equal and opposite to the wind stress once we're in equilibrium. Now, let's think about another situation. This has already started, but now what happens if the wind stops? So the water is already moving in a certain direction and the wind suddenly stops. Well, in this case, the water's already moving, so it's still going to have Coriolis acting on it to its right. And so the water will get turned to its right and then Coriolis will act on it again and turn it to its right. And Coriolis will act on that water and turn that to its right. And Coriolis will act on that water and turn it to its right. And Coriolis will act on that and turn it to the right. And Coriolis will act on that parcel of water and turn it to the right. And so what we see is that when we have Coriolis acting, and that's the only force acting on a water parcel that already has inertia, that if something starts the water in motion, a wind stress, and then stops pushing on the water, it has inertia, the water parcel still has inertia, but now the only force acting on it is Coriolis. 
So Coriolis will turn the water parcel to the right in the northern hemisphere, to the left in the southern hemisphere. So the water parcel will move in a circle. This tells us that this water parcel has a centripetal force, a centripetal force that must come from the only force acting on the water parcel, Coriolis. We remember that when we have an object moving in a circle, if it's moving in a circle, that means there is a force going towards the center of the circle. And this centripetal force is supplied by some other force, and it's equal to the mass times V squared over R, where this is the mass, this is the velocity squared over the radius of the circle. All right, so what we end up with when that happens is we get these inertial currents. And we've seen this before. This is from DeSaro et al., 1995. And we have some Lagrangian drifter that has some inertia. And because it has some inertia, it starts to move in a circle. And we see all these little circles from these different drifters that are moving in these circles, these inertial circles. And these inertial circles are characterized by which latitude they're at. So if they're here at 46.5 degrees, then they will have a certain Coriolis parameter due to that latitude. So their F will, deter will determine what the period is. The period of these inertial currents is going to be 2 pi over F. And in the northern hemisphere, they will turn in a clockwise direction. And in the southern hemisphere, they'll turn in a counterclockwise direction. All right, so let's come back to our equations of motion, especially when we first talked about adding Coriolis to our equations of motion. So we see that we have our acceleration term, that's equal to one over our density times the um, negative of our pressure gradient force, our horizontal pressure gradient force in the x direction horizontal pressure gradient, that gives us our pressure gradient force, plus Coriolis force in the x direction, which of course will be rho times v times f in the x direction, plus any other forces, including friction and any other forces. Now, in the case of an inertial current, what we're saying is that the only force that is giving us our acceleration is Coriolis. So we're saying that there in this case, for an inertial current, there is no pressure gradient force and there is no friction or any other forces. The only thing that's acting is Coriolis. All right, so looking just in the x direction, that tells us that all the acceleration terms are going to be equal to 1 over the density times the Coriolis force. Okay, so let's come back to our example of our inertial currents. So we said Coriolis turns the water parcel, so it moves in a circle. So it has a centripetal force that must come from the only force acting on the water parcel, Coriolis. So let's see what this looks like. Okay, so that tells us that we have some sort of force balance. We have so the centripetal force must be, e must be due to our Coriolis force. So these have to be equal. Our centripetal force, as we talked about, for our circle is going to be nv squared over r. But what we're really talking about here is a force per volume. So in that case, what we'll have is rho v squared over r. And that must be equal to our Coriolis force, which we know is rho v f. Well, that gives us a fourth balance, but what we see that's really nice and helpful is that we have a row on both sides of the equation, so I can divide through by my density. And when I do that, what I'm left with is no longer a force balance, but an acceleration balance. So now I have the centripetal acceleration, v squared over r, is equal to v times f. All right, so let's come back to this idea that we had already looking at our equation the motion in the x direction. We have our acceleration terms are equal to 1 over density times our Coriolis force. 
Well, here again, we also have one over the density times the density. So let's go ahead and multiply that through. So now I have my acceleration terms are equal to my acceleration due to Coriolis. So we have our same acceleration balance. So let's bring our acceleration balance that we had due to the fact that this acceleration is in fact a centripetal acceleration. So the acceleration balance that we had on the last slide showed us that we had v squared over r is equal to v times f. This is our acceleration term in this case. So we see that we have v squared over r is equal to v times f. And what we can do is take the ratio of our acceleration terms right here, v squared over r, and take a ratio of these, the acceleration terms, the v squared over r, which is equal to our acceleration term, over our Coriolis acceleration. And so the ratio of the acceleration terms to Coriolis is v squared over r over v. Well, I've got a v squared on the top and I've got a v in my denominator, so I'll go ahead and cancel out one of each of those v's, and what I'm left with is v over r times f. And that v over r times f is our non is our non-dimensional Rossby number. It's the velocity over the length scale times the Coriolis parameter. This number is very powerful because it tells us the ratio of our acceleration terms to Coriolis. It tells us the relative importance of the acceleration terms and Coriolis. And so we can use it to help us to simplify our equations of motion. So here's our Rossby number. Our Rossby number, we know, is the ratio of our acceleration terms to Coriolis. It's the velocity over some length scale times the Coriolis parameter. So if the Rossby number is about one, that means that both the acceleration terms and the Coriolis terms are important. And so we have to keep all of them in our equation of motion. I'm just looking at the x direction here. So we keep both our acceleration terms and our Coriolis terms if the Rossby number is about equal to one. However, if our Rossby number is very, very big, it's much bigger than one, then that means that in this ratio right here, it is the acceleration terms that are on top. And those acceleration terms that are on top here, the acceleration terms, those acceleration terms must be much bigger than the Coriolis terms, which are on the bottom. So what we can say in this case is that the Coriolis terms are not very important and we can actually eliminate them from our, equations of of our equation of motion and make our equation of motion simpler. Now, if in fact the Rossby number is much less than one, then that means that in this case, the acceleration terms, the acceleration terms, which again are in our numerator, that those much, are much less than our Coriolis terms, which are in our denominator. So in that case, what we see is that the acceleration terms are not very big, and we can ignore those. So we can go ahead and eliminate those from our, equations, our equation of motion and make it a much simpler equation. Now, if the Rossby number is much less than one. Well, in that case, we know that we can eliminate our acceleration terms. Now, if we also assume that the ocean is inviscid, so there's no friction and there are no other forces, then the acceleration terms are not very big and this friction term is not very big. So we are left with only our Coriolis term, our Coriolis term and 
our pressure gradient force. So we can rewrite this by I'm multiplying through my one over rho, so that will cancel rho out of this term here, and I have one over rho here, and I'll add this term to the other side of my equation, and what I have is one over rho dp dx is equal to v times f. So what we see in this case is the negative in this case, that the horizontal pressure gradient force, because the horizontal pressure gradient force is the negative of the pressure gradient, is equal to Coriolis. So the horizontal pressure gradient force is equal and opposite to Coriolis in this case. And we know that that occurs when we have, that is describing our geostrophic balance. So if we have a Rossby number that is very, very small, if our Rossby number is much less than one, that can tell us and we know that, that we are far away from any boundaries. We're out in, um, in the middle of the, of the open ocean, so there's no friction. Then we can assume that we can have geostrophic balance, which is what we see in our subtropical gyres.